What's up? This is Max Green from Violent New Breed, and you're watching Richard Metal Fan. Hey, what's up, guys? Episode 182 of Richard Metal Fan Interviews, calling from Zoom, and I'm here with Max Green from Violent New Breed. How are you doing today, Max? Great to be able to talk with you today. I'm doing good, Richard. It's good to finally uh, be able to talk with you. <laughs> yeah, it's great to be able to talk with you. And I just noticed like you had like your name, Dick McRiddles. <laughs> How did that come to be? Is that like a nickname or something? <laughs> All right. There's a story behind this. I always forget that I named my phone that. And uh, I just recently got a new phone and I meant to name it something else. But it just became Dick McGriddle's number two. Um, but <laughs> the, the story is um, a long time ago uh, I when I was in Russia with Escape the Fate, Um. I was, it was a long flight over there. I was like, um, just like exhausted, kind of loopy from the, uh, just like lack of sleep and like the time zone change. Um, and so we were getting ready to go on stage and we were in the back room. And for some reason I was just messing around with one of our, um, one of our tech guys and, uh, just like having fun with them, just good fun or whatever. And, um, I looked at him and I looked at my tour manager I said, here's the deal. While we're in Russia, my name is Dick McGriddles. I said, you want me to play? You better say, Dick McGriddles, get ready to go on stage. Because if you say, Max, time's, it's time to go, I'm not moving. I'm not answering anything <laughs> except for Dick McGriddles the entire time we're here. So I made everybody call me Dick McGriddles. <laughs> <laughs> That's just wild, man. <laughs> So yeah. kind of kind of like the format of the show is I want to do like a rundown of your discography and talk about like your musical history. So take you back to young Max Green. So kind of growing up, what were the first bands that got you into metal? What made you want to slap at the bass? Okay, so growing up, um, I was born in a small, small village in Ohio. And very early on, uh, I moved to Pahrump, Nevada, um, which is not too far from Las Vegas. And when I was living there in Pahrump, at the time, there was really nothing there. Um, I remember the only grocery store we had was like this little Ma and Pa grocery store that looked like a looked like a, 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 a storm could like roll through and like blow it over at any minute. Um, and there was like a couple gas stations and that's it. Um, so there was really not a lot going on. Um, and so aside from the soccer team I was on, I had a lot of time to just ride my bike to the desert and listen to music. Um, so I remember when we got settled in, um, I found the box of my parents' um, CDs. And I remember um, going through my stepdad's CDs and I saw this album and it was... Motley Cruz, a decade of decadence. This was like a greatest hit CD. Um, and like one of the first few tracks on that album was this song called Shout at the Devil. And I was like, oh man, like that's like let's let's go to that one. Um, and I heard it and I was like, oh my gosh, like who is this band? Like Motley Crue, like this is crazy, this is so cool. Um, and that just I became like obsessed and it was that and then I put in Metallica and early on like I always really liked bands like Nirvana and stuff a whole lot um and then I found uh then I found Marilyn Manson and when I was younger this was like Manson's glory days you know what I mean like Manson was king of just everything um and that was like i was like oh man like his music speaks to me like i feel a connection with like him and a lot of other you know music that i listen to so i begged my parents for a guitar and they said no my stepdad said no absolutely not he was he was a very militant old school type guy so he was like no you got to go to college you need to either go to college um or join the military or um get a construction job but those are, like the only acceptable things um, so my mom's brother, who was my uncle, he came down one year for Christmas from Ohio and gave me his guitar as a surprise. And my stepdad was pissed and I was happy. Um, yeah. so yeah. I took that guitar and I 
took and I brought to my room and I just yeah. sat and I played. I, I didn't know anything about it. And I just figured it out. And um, about the time I got to high school, I started meeting other people who played. Yeah. Um, and then. And do you remember what the first guitar was like the type? Yeah, it was, it was an Ibanez. Um, and it was just like, it was a, I, I remember what it looks like. I don't remember the exact model of it, but I remember it was it was a cheap low end Ibanez. Um, it was like one of the Geo series that they got that they have out now. But I remember it had a humbucker in the back and two single coil pickups. It was blue with a white pickguard, and I put stickers all over it because I thought that looked really cool. Um, and when I got to high school. I started asking people if they wanted to come over to my house and jam because I had a guitar. And I met this kid named um, Robert Pringle. And I asked him if he wanted, because I knew he had a guitar. I knew he played. So I asked him if he wanted to start a band. And he said, well, I've already, I already have a band, dude. He said, but our bass player just quit two days ago. So if you want to come over to my house, he's like, if you want to hang out, listen to the songs and He's like, if you, he's like, he goes, if you at least have rhythm, like, we'll probably let you be in our band. And I was like, okay, sure, dude. So I went to his house and I watched his band and then I picked up the bass. Um, and I started just playing along with the guys. And um, it was very easy. I don't know. I also just, I guess I caught on quickly. And from there, it was like, you know what? It's like, I don't want to play guitar anymore. Like, everyone plays guitar. Like, I want to be the best bass player there is because there's not many bass players. So I want to be the dopest bass player and stand out like that. Yeah. Yeah, because I know at the, like everybody likes to make jokes and memes about the bass player. But hey, hey, I feel like the bass is important. Yeah, totally. Bass is very, bass is very, very cool, man, because honestly... And I would never have really realized this unless I played bass or unless I, you know, became like a musician. But the bass is a very interesting instrument because you can change the feel. You can change the entire feel of a song. Um, you know, you can play along and play all the low notes and make us make the song, you know, feel really heavy or feel, you know, really sad by playing, you know, minors or whatever. Or you can, you know you can go up an octave and, you know, do a little bass run or whatever. And you can build tension. You can make the song sound happy. Like you can do everything. You can play along with the music or as a bass player, you can kind of like write your own song around the band song and just have fun with it like that. Like there really is a lot to bass and, you know, I mean, I get it. Like, I think the bass jokes are funny too, but to be a good bass player, like, Honestly, those guys are badass. And without a good bass player, bands usually suck, to be honest. Yeah, I remember hearing like an interview with uh, Troy Sanders from the band Mastodon. Heck, he describes as like the bass is sort of like the special stuff in the sandwich. Like the guitars are usually like the bread and the bass is sort of like that special like kind of like stuff in the middle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. with uh, Without without a, a bass on an album, like it's funny because a lot of people go, oh, man, is these guitars sound so heavy on this album, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, it, it, they do. But if you took away the bass, like that album, you wouldn't be able to feel it in here. You know what I mean? Like that bass really thickens everything up and fills everything out. So it's cool. Yeah. And so we're, we're, people obviously know you from like Escape the Fate and of course, it's Violent New Breed. Were you in any bands before starting up Escape the Fate? Um, yeah, I was in, I mean, nothing that anyone would know or anything like that. I was in two, two bands when I was in high school. Uh, the first band I was ever in, um, was called, uh, we were called Almost Heroes. It was that guy Robert's band that I joined. Um, and he already, they already had a name and everything like that. So I just joined their band. It was, it was Almost Heroes and we played around and it was, it was cool. Like we, we got to play at my high school and, it was uh it was fun and then the second band i was ever in before escape the fate was um a band with ronnie and robert ortiz and that was a band called a uh, true story and i hated that name because it was right when toy story came out and i was like our band name sounds like toy story i was like this is stupid <laughs> and they all out they all outvoted me so i was like all right well we're in a band called true story i guess yeah <laughs> 
And so how did how did you get to know the guys in Escape the Fate? Because I know Escape the Fate formed in 2004. Um, I don't know what year we formed, to be honest with you, but yeah. I um so um Ronnie and Robert, uh, we all went to the same high school. Um, and actually there was a talent show at my high school and my band and Ronnie's band, um, uh, Ronnie and Robert were in a band together and, uh, we were kind of like the, the two bands at our high school that were live bands. So we were, had this kind of rivalry just automatically. And I remember, uh, my band went up and performed and we got accepted. And then Ronnie's band went up to perform and, um, they like were fumbling around and, and then they, they got their shit together and then I remember like Ronnie had knocked over his mic stand, but he was playing guitar and he didn't know what to do. He was like panicking. So my band was like, my band started laughing at him. And so I got up out of my seat and went up to the front and picked up his microphone stand, picked up his microphone and put it back on for him and set it up so that he could finish his audition. And uh, he like looked at me like conf- kind of confused, like, why would you like, why would you do that? <laughs> you know, like, why would you help me? And uh, afterwards, he asked me to come over to, he asked me, he said, hey, man, if you want to come hang out with us, like, we're going to go to band practice. And I was like, yeah, I would love to. Like, my, I want to practice with my band, but they're all going to go do other stuff. So I'll, I'll come hang out with you guys. And um, hung out with them, and their bass player had to leave early that day. And so I was bored watching them play. So I asked him if I could plug in a bass and, and just kind of jam with them. And as soon as I did, I kind of started adding on my own little ideas to their songs. And Ronnie immediately stopped playing. and was like, dude, we got to kick out our old bass player. You got to join our band right now, man. <laughs> and so uh, that's how me, Ronnie, and Robert Ortiz um, started playing music together. Yeah. Yeah. And then tell me about yeah. like, and then, the, uh, you know, you're saying. Oh, I was just going to say that we, we met and then we, we ended up meeting uh, Brian uh, and Omar through um, through an ad um, at the time. I think it was like um, like lvlocalmusicscene.com was like this website where like local musicians would go on to like just like post ads like, hey, you know, guitar player looking for a project or whatever. And he ended up finding us on there um, and called us up one day and asked if we wanted to play. And he, uh, he was like, hey, I heard you guys are, you know, pretty serious in Vegas and yada yada and you know it's like i'm a guitar player and i have another guy with me we want to play with you guys so then that's how we met brian and omar and then from there it was just magic yeah i'm always curious about pahrumpf nevada i've always i'm only ever been to vegas twice how far is that from vegas um i believe it's like an hour and a half away i think oh wow yeah, because I've been yeah. to Vegas twice there for a festival called Psycho Las Vegas. I saw a lot of like death metal bands and black metal bands, and it was a great time. Yeah. It's a bit. I, I kind of wish everything wasn't expensive. But what do you expect? It's fucking Las Vegas. Yeah, where are you from? I'm from a. a I live in a Kennesaw, Georgia. It's like 35 minutes north of Atlanta. That's right. You told me that. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Oh, you know what? You want to know a fucking fun little fact that no one really knows? Um, Ooh, do tell. The first Violet New Breed EP, um, the one that has my vocals on it, yeah. um, I actually recorded that in uh, Georgia in this little town called uh, Coweta. Coweta. I'm not really that familiar with that. It's Either near Colum- Columbus, Georgia. Yeah, I've never been to Columbus, so I don't really, I'm not that familiar with that area. It's like the town where they film all the Walking Dead shit. Like everything oh, really? in this town is Walking Dead themed. Yeah, because they yeah. film it there. Yeah, so it was in but, the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, tell me about like that first self titled EP that came out in 05. I love it. Some of the early versions that would end up on on dying as early as fashion. Like, tell me about like that. That where was that recorded at? So, um, we <clears throat> we um we went to go, and I remember we we were a band for a little bit, and um, Ronnie had been in contact with this producer who used to live in Las Vegas at the time named uh, Elvis Basquette. And um, Ronnie did a, did a, just like a handshake deal with him basically saying like, he said, Hey man, like I'll do, I'll do a demo for you. And here's the deal is if you ever, you know, use this demo and get signed or get a deal or anything, the deal is you have to come back to me for your first record and you have to tell the label that. 
and Ronnie said, okay. So Ronnie ended up doing, um, Ronnie ended up recording uh, As You're Falling Down, uh, a song called Makeup, and then um, a song called, oh, uh, Not Good Enough for Truth and Cliche, and then um, another one called uh, Listen Up. And Listen Up was actually an old true story song that he kind of revamped oh, wow. for for his project. Yeah. And um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> And then, so that's where those versions originally came from. And then when we got together and started playing around as Escape the Fate, um, we wanted to go record it, uh, an album. And so Omar, he was kind of like the band dad. And he uh, he had been signed before. He had been signed to a label. He had been on tour. So he was the guy who was like, you know, with the connections or whatever. And he, he knew people. So he called up one of his friends who he worked with before um and who he recorded with before and he was like hey you know i want i want you to record my band we, we saved up some money and the guy was named the guy's name was ryan baker and he lived in like ventura california and so he came out and watched us practice and it was really weird because he was like yeah your songs sound great like i don't want to change anything and we were like okay so we went to his house and started recording songs and did a couple demos there we did an early demo of um no sympathy for the dead um for and not good enough for truth and cliche and a couple other songs but um yeah i like that early version of not good especially with the video it looked like you were all were like playing like outside and then in like a little concert thing oh yeah 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 so yeah so that that version was from uh was from elvis was from michael basket yeah yeah yeah, and y'all looked so young back then. It was like weird seeing like Ronnie with like less tattoos in there. It just looked like re really interesting thing, but awesome at the same time. Yeah, right. It's it's, it's crazy to look back at that. Um, it's wild. Yeah, and and then of course, I've, apparently from what I did, like in two thousand five, you won like a radio contest, like oh, like judged by My Chemical Romance, and you got open up the show on their tour with alkaline trio and then of course you eventually got signed to uh epitaph how did epitaph find escape the fate so um back in the early myspace days um we had put our songs the songs that ronnie did with elvis with my with michael basket um sorry i keep calling him elvis because that's like his that's his nickname um but um so as we're falling down and not good enough for truth and cliche, uh, we had put online on our on the band's profile, and there was this kid who his aunt was like a secretary or a receptionist at Epitaph or like worked in the mailroom or something, and um, he was like he found our band on MySpace and was like, "Oh, this is so great! I love it. These guys are great. Can, you know, I want to see them in concert." Blah blah blah. So he ended up telling his aunt about us and uh he went into his aunt's work and i guess maybe played the music and someone was like oh who is that or some way one way or another they ended up telling the right people at epitaph about us and so um they wrote us and they wrote they wrote me a message originally and um the owner did his name was brett gerowitz he was the guitar player in bad religion he he wrote me and said, "Hey, um, I'm I'm you know I recently heard Escape the Fate. I'm I'm wondering if I'm reaching out to the right people. Um, if I am, like you know, please contact me back. I'm really interested. I want to talk to you guys. Um, thanks, Brett Gerowitz, Epitaph Records. And at the time, we were getting a lot of attention from record labels, and a lot of the emails were fake, and so or they were like really small labels that just wanted to like take advantage of us." Um, and so I saw the email and immediately thought it was fake. And so I just hit delete. And then a couple of days later, I got another message and I saw it and I read it and it was the same thing from Brett. And he said, Hey, I'm trying to reach out and find, you know, so-and-so from escape the fate. You know, I, I love this song and that song. I'd really love to talk to you guys. I was like, Oh my gosh. I was like, this guy's persistent delete. And I deleted it again. <laughs> so <laughs> This time we were we were out in California recording with that guy Ryan Baker, and I got two more emails from Epitaph Records from Brett Gerowitz. And finally, I'm I'm in the I'm on the computer and I shout to the other room. I was like, "Hey!" I was like, "Do you guys know a Does anyone know a Brett Gerowitz from Epitaph Records?" 
I was like, this guy keeps writing me, and I don't know if he's really awake. And then I heard, because they were recording in the other room, and I heard the music stop, and I heard the producer, Ryan, go, did you say Brett Gerwitz in Epitaph? I said, yeah. He go, yeah, that's a real person, dude. He's like, what did he say? I was like, oh, he said he wants to meet with us. I was like, I've been deleting his emails. <laughs> and so, <laughs> yeah, and so uh, we arranged a meeting, met with them, just got to, you know, went out to lunch or whatever, and then um, – they watched, they came out to a show and watched us play and then, you know, talked to us about what our goals were and stuff. And if we'd ever toured and then we told them no, and they said they were interested, but they don't, they don't want to take us on just yet. So we had to, we had to like do a couple things on like their checklist first. We had to like tour to like two or three other States. We had to like book a tour. Um, and uh, finish our finish our album and um, something else. And I remember we rented a van and we would go play in Utah and California and Arizona. We called him back and told him all about it. And uh, then um, we entered. Here, here's where the My Chemical Romance thing comes in. Is um, you know, like I said, Epitaph had come out and watched us play a couple of local shows and they really liked it. Um, so like we had him on the hook. And then My Chemical Romance came and did, was doing that contest, and we entered one of our songs. And I remember one of my friends called me up and said, "Dude, they just they just said your name on Extreme Radio, like you guys won." And I was like, "Don't mess with me, man!" And they're like, "No, you won." So I called the radio station, and I said, "Hey, I said who won the um, My Chemical Romance competition?" And they said, "Escape the Fate." And I was like, "Ah!" I was started screaming, and the per the DJ goes, "Oh, are you a big fan?" I said, no, I'm in the band, dude. Like, that's my band. And they were like, hold on right now. We're going to put you on live radio. So then they waited for the commercial to end, and they put me on, on live radio right there and said, oh, we've got Max Green, the bass player from Escape the Fate. He just found out that he's opening for My Chemical Romance. How do you feel about that, dude? And I was like, I feel fucking awesome. And um, so we ended up winning, and it was on our own, which was awesome. It was There was no help from any outside labels or anything. And then – uh. So we got that show and we played it in that day. I remember we told Epitaph, we said, Hey, we're opening for my chem. Like we entered the contest and we won by ourselves. And so that, that day that we played with them, they sent down a contract that day for us to sign. Um, basically saying like, um, we agree not to talk to any other labels. So basically they were like, we, we want to like hold you, like just don't do anything till we can get down this weekend. And, and come talk to you. So we, we signed a contract saying that we would, we would wait for them and that essentially we were interested and they were interested in us. And then um, from there, it was just, yeah, we knew what we wanted and they, they knew what they wanted. Yeah. And so tell me about making dying is your latest fashion. I think it's a really great date view album. So what was like the thought process going into making the first escape the fade album? Um. Well, the thought process, real quick, I'll tell you this, though, real fast. The thought process started even before this. So that guy who we were recording with originally in Ventura, we didn't read his contract. And when we when we um, we just signed it, we didn't really read it all. We didn't know. We trusted him. And when we were talking Epitaph, they asked us, they were like, did you guys read the contract you signed with Ryan, your producer? We were like, well, sort of, but we don't we don't know what any of that shit means. And they said, well, he owns all your music and he's charging us $35,000 oh, just shit. to be able to have this conversation with you right now. We're like, what? They're like, yeah. So they're like, we, we worked out a deal with him and we're going to pay it. But we just want to let you know that's how badly we want you guys. So they paid 30, they paid him 35 grand for him to release our music so that we could re-record it under Epitaph Records. And so we went into th that first album, Dying Angeles Fashion, like hungry. Like we wanted to, we were pissed off. You know what I mean? That someone, this guy had taken advantage of us. He didn't even finish our our album for us. And he was already trying to like screw us out of like our dream. Yeah. So we told Epitaph, like we want to go back to Elvis. So we had to go to Elvis and it just trust us. And uh, we ended up working on a deal with them where we did the EP um, no sympathy for the dead and dying usually as fashion, um, all in one, all in one trip. Um, and, uh, 
yeah, it was, it was, I don't know. It was, it was like, we, we, we wanted to make a statement. Like our whole thing back then was like, you know, we, we didn't play by the rules. We did what we wanted to do and that's it. You know, and people liked it. They caught on to it. We were all about authenticity and just like being real. And, you know, because we were always like, you know what? People can smell a fake. They know when you're faking it. They know when you're pretending. And that was it, you know? Yeah. It's still like a great, great debut. You know, I consider it like one of the best debut albums of this generation, especially like, <laughs> like hearing like songs like Situations, Guillotine, Teen, There's a no Sympathy for the Dead or Not Good Enough for the Truth than cliche i especially love the situations video it seems like you all had a fun time making that then i remember recently having uh robert on on the show he kind of described it as like uh, because it is similar to like hot for teacher by van halen in a way yeah we um yeah that was sorry my wife's uh texting me (laughs) um yeah that doing situations and everything was uh it was very cool it was awesome you know it was great too because epitaph um when they stepped in and we signed with them, they were very cool. They were, they told us, we're like, they, were, they said, Hey, you know, um, we're not going to tell you guys what to do. We're not going to tell you what to wear or anything like that. They're like, you know, we, we feel we do have experience and we, we kind of have, you know, a, an idea of probably what's, what we want to do with you and, and where you should go. And, uh, originally they loved the song, um, not good enough for truth and cliche. And so they originally pictured us, they wanted to market us as in what their words were in edgy Hawthorne Heights. And I was like, have you even heard the rest of our songs, man? Like we are not a Hawthorne Heights band. Um, And so we, we did the album, we did what we wanted to do. And they said, well, okay. Like the other songs are great let us just pick the first video and then you guys can pick all your singles from there. So they did, they picked not good over truth and cliche. We released it. And then we picked to do situations and we showed them like what we were into. And then they were immediately like, all right, like we get it. Like we see where you guys want to go. Like, um, and yeah, originally we had a lot more scenes in that video that were, um, that were like were like an homage, like a throwback to Hot for Teacher. Like we actually had like the suits and like the disco ball that came down, and we were gonna all do like yeah. that scene where <laughs> that, that yeah. would have been awesome, man. <laughs> yeah, we but we didn't have time. We were, there was that one and one other scene that we were gonna do, but yeah, yeah we we weren't able to. So yeah. especially love yeah. like the intro with like the the kid. I guess Thurman was his name, and especially with Ronnie driving the bus. I wonder what what that. Yeah. Thur- who the, the kid that played Thurman is doing nowadays? Here, if he even remembers, I don't know. Right? He, you know, he was also in a uh, Super Bad. I think. Oh, really? I haven't seen that movie in years. Yeah, he was. He had this really. He had this small part where um, there's this part in that movie where like Jonah Hill is talking about when he was a kid. He used to draw dicks everywhere. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> that Thurman kid. He's like in the uh, in like the the flashback scene of like of a, of a little kid like opening a open up a journal and seeing like this big crazy dick being drawn or whatever and like yeah <laughs> yeah but then of course you, you toured for a little bit and then I know then there was this the whole shit with Ronnie Ronnie Radke which of course we don't I want to get obviously you don't want to get into but but during that time time was there even doubt of like continuing doing escape the fate without Ronnie um so when all that shit went down I mean I don't care I don't care to talk about it I mean I, I can talk we'll talk about it if you want to I don't, I don't really I don't really care it's been a long time so it doesn't matter but, yeah I mean it's um, all water under the bridge now yeah exactly um so at the time man when, when he left um me personally like i was devastated because this was a guy who i had lived with for the last like you know however many years we were attached at the hip man like we were homeless together we did everything together you know we, we robbed grocery stores together so we could eat 
We, you know, broke into places together so we could have a place to sleep. We did everything. Um, and, you know, when he went to jail, I was upset because I told him not to do the thing he did. And so I was upset because I was like, man, you could have avoided all this shit. And like, you not only risked yourself, but you risked all of us too. And that's fucked up. Um, you know, we were like, it's just that that's just selfish Ronnie, like only thinking about himself like usual. And um, so we were upset, but like, I did not want to go on without him. I remember Robert and Ronnie or Robert and Brian, they didn't know what they were going to do. They thought they were just going to quit music and, and have to get jobs and everything else. And being the co-founder of the band, I remember the label called me up one day and said, well, hey, like, you guys have this album, you have this record deal, um, your album just came out, and you have a good, like, momentum about you, and you have all this brand new merchandise, so you can either find another singer and keep going, or, you know, you can just, we, we can just be done with you guys all together, like, that's it, like, sorry, better luck next time. Yeah. And so, um, basically, they were saying, like, you know, we need to find another singer. And we had, there was other conversations where, you know, they kind of were um, like trying to give me like, trying to say, well, hey, what about this guy? Or what about that guy? And, you know, blah, blah, blah. And my whole thing was like, well, I, I want to know what's going on with Ronnie. I want to know what's going on. And once we found out that he wasn't going to be out for, you know, originally we heard it was 10 years. Um, we we're like, okay, well, we have to find another singer. You know, we have to. Yeah. Yeah, and so, so and so, how did you hook up with uh, Craig? Because I know, like, I think Escape the Fame and Bless the Fall did like tours together in like '07. Yeah, yeah. So it's funny because um, we hooked up with Craig by by chance, by complete accident. Um, Craig was on tour over in the UK with Bless the Fall, and I guess they kicked him out because he was he got he got caught drinking and at the time like they wanted to be a christian metal band and they wanted to be on like um um some record label I can't remember what label it is oh they wanted to be on tooth and nail really badly yeah and so um they like had kicked craig out and so craig flew back to the states and he was originally wanting to try out for um a skylight drive so he had the number for this guy named Joey, who at the time, our manager's name was Joey. And uh, there was a guitar player in Bless the Fall, or in uh, a Skylight Drive named Joey. And so Craig got on his phone, called Joey, thinking he was calling the guitar player from a Skylight Drive. And he said, yo, what's up, man? And our manager answered. And he said, yo, what's up? And our manager's like, what's up, man? He goes, who's this? He goes, it's Craig, man. I'm like, don't you, like, duh. He's like, yo, he goes, uh, are you going to send me those tracks? And my manager said, what tracks? He goes, the tracks, man. Like, I, I want to try out some shit. Like, now, bless the fall. I'm like, I want to try out for, uh, for, for Skylet, man. And my manager goes, do you know who you're talking to right now? He's like, yeah, Joey. He goes, yeah, Joey, the manager of Escape the Fate. It's like, He's like, oh, shit. He's like, Craig goes, I meant to call Joey, the guitar player from a, from a Skylet Drive. So they both had a laugh. And Craig was like, okay, well, I'll, I'll talk to you later, man. And our manager said, well, wait. He's like, no one knows this yet. Like, this just happened. And, like, we've, we've kept it on the down low. But Ronnie's in prison. And Escape the Fate needs a singer. Um, do you want to try out? Like, they're doing vocal. They're, they're auditioning vocalists, like, on, like, the down, down low. Um, and he was like, holy shit. He's like, yeah, dude, I definitely want to try out. So he flew out and tried out. And to be honest, um, I was not feeling it at first. I told the guys, no, no, he's not it. He's not the one. So we sent him home like two or three times and was like, you know, keep practicing, like, you know, try to sing him like this, like try to find your own kind of style and doing it. And then, uh, Finally, he came out one time and we were just like, he, he got it. And we were like, we were like, okay, like we might be able to pull this off. Like we could, we might be able to do this. And, and then it, it just ended up 
we ended up, the more we hung out, the more we vibed, the more we got to know each other, the more everyone got comfortable, the more Craig kind of like, kind of saw like what we were all about. And uh, yeah, it just ended up being what it was. Yeah. And were you like nervous at all? Like, like replacing Ronnie with Craig? Because anytime when bands like change singers, there's always that thing of what work or one at work. And, and like, for example, like with Iron Maiden, like I remember after they, they Paul Diano left the band and then they got Bruce Dickinson, and a lot of people were used, to, were wondering how it would work. And then they put out number of the beast and it's still one of the best metal d- albums of all time. So how was that like working with a uh, Craig as opposed to Ronnie? Um, it was very nerve wracking, dude, because Ronnie had a very unique voice. And, uh, you know, I used to say that, you know, I mean, obviously it's completely different now. Ronnie's been, you know, singing for a very long time and he's phenomenal now. But I, I would say that in the beginning, I used to say that what Ronnie lacks in experience and as a vocalist, he makes up for in charisma and just you know, just that, just charisma and, uh, yeah. And, and like believing in, in the shit that he's saying. And so, um, like that was like his thing was he was, he was all right at singing, but he just, he just sang and spoke with such like, you know, with such charisma and with such like fucking like, wow. And, uh, so it was, so it worked. And Craig was completely different. Craig was a singer. He could do all this crazy shit. He could sing real high. He could sing low. He could scream. He could do it all. And uh, But his voice was very clean and, like, nasally at first. Um, and I remember telling him, I'm like, don't sing high, man. Bring it down here. Like, um, So we were hella nervous. And I remember it came time to do our sophomore album and the label asked us who we wanted to go to. And um, we were all really stoked on John Feldman. I remember story of the year album came out and it sounded cool. And we were like, man, that that shit hits dude. Like we want to go to, we want to go to someone like John Feldman. It was great because John actually really liked Craig's voice. And once he heard that Craig was in the band, he was like, yes. He's like, I I really want to work with Craig. Like, I love that guy's voice. You know, Craig Mavitt with Escape the Fate. He was like, I'm on board. So that was cool. So John really helped us out a lot. Um, He helped kind of guide us in a direction because we, dude, we had like a bunch of riffs, but no actual songs. So we went to the studio to do that, that album, uh, This War Is Ours. We had nothing. We had one song that I had written that we ended up turning into the flood and we had a handful of riffs and that was it. Yeah. Yeah. But hard to believe this year does mark 15 years of this war is ours, which is definitely my favorite escape the fate album. I consider it kind of like, like this generation's like master of puppets in a way. Why? So what was the the recording process like? And usually with the debut album, you have like your entire life to write and there's a lot of, a lot of like hype with the first album. Did you feel like pressure to follow up Dying Years Lee's fashion going to This War Is Ours? Uh, absolutely. And for many reasons, you know, one, because Ronnie was, you know, Ronnie was a great writer and everything he sang was very real. And again, like I said earlier, like that was like one of Escape the Fate's strong points was that everything we said, everything we did was real. How we acted, the shit we talked about, the stories that you hear, they're all real. That's how we were. We were fucking crazy. And we did crazy shit and we fucking we would come and we would fucking play and we would we would bring the house down. Um and so it was very nerve wracking. Like one, we were like, well, you know, Craig writes completely different than Ronnie. You know, and so I used to write lyrics with Ronnie and stuff when in the beginning. And so I I tried to help Craig and be like, hey well you know, let's write together. I used to write with Ronnie. Let me write with you. Let me kind of kind of change like the you're... dynamic in a way. Yeah. And so, uh, but it was great because going with Feldman, um, it was cool because I mean, we always, the thing about escape the fate that we liked was that we, we, we felt like we didn't have one sound. We felt like we could do songs that were like very pop punk and we could do songs that were kind of like, 
you know, metalish or emo or whatever. And we could just kind of do it all. And like that collectively like became like a sound. Like we we didn't sound like other bands. We sounded like us. And yeah. um, so getting Feldman in there and getting Craig, we, we wanted to make sure that we covered all our bases. Like basically the idea was to not rewrite Dying Years Latest Fashion because we didn't want to do that. But we wanted to write the next evolution of Dying Years Latest Fashion basically yeah. yeah and you yeah. mentioned like every song sounds different like a song like we won't back down is different than ashley or so different than something or even like the title track to even 10 miles wide i feel like every song sort of like captures like an emotion like that you and craig and ed monty and robert were feeling at the time yeah absolutely like i think i think one of my favorite tracks on that album is uh on to the next one i love that song yeah which is track two yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I'm also curious what curious about like the title track and being guillotine part two. What made you guys decide to do like a part two of a song that you did from the first album? So that was kind of like a statement piece right there. That was us saying, like, you know, hey, like we're still escape the fate, and like this is who we are. And Craig is the man and Craig is us too. You know what I mean? It was kind of like us proving to everyone that, Hey, like fucking, you know, we can like, we've got it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yes, Ronnie was a big deal. Him leaving was a big deal, but you know, we're, we're fucking, we're going to, we're going to make this shit dope. You know, don't worry. So that was kind of, kind of like that. Yeah, and it's like the heaviest song on the album, and it's still pretty much one of my favorite Escape the Fate songs. You know, here's another thing that people don't know. Is John Feldman fought with us tooth and nail up to the very, very last day about putting that intro with the sweeps in that yeah. in the on that song. He didn't want it at all. He was like, No, it's too much. I don't like it. Like you guys shouldn't do it. And he wanted us to do this intro where we just held like these dissonant like chords like and have like an intro like that to the song and we were like no absolutely not it was like we told him we're like sweeps or don't put the song on the album like that's yeah, it's it. like, like the most technical so- song to date yeah we were like we feel very strongly about it we were like and we think you need to trust us like kids our fans will love it like we're yeah. telling you like trust us yeah. And yeah, that was became one of the most iconic songs. Yeah, and then tell me about Ten Miles Wide working with a uh, Josh from Buckcherry. How did he end up up singing on that song? Um, so that was um being our sophomore album, our label was like many labels, they sometimes like because there's a lot writing on a sophomore album, usually, and so they wanted to just give us like a little extra oomph in case we needed it. So Josh Todd was real hot at the time and uh, Buck Terry was like killing it. And so uh, they were like, well, Hey, you know, our manager, Joey, he was friends with Josh Todd. And so uh, he gave him a call and see if he was interested in coming down to, to write with us and whatever. So he come, he came and hung out for a day and he was like, yeah, man, I like, I like, the, I like the guys. Like I'll come write a song with them. So he came back and uh, we we showed him the riff. I remember because I remember Monty was playing that intro riff and him and I, I remember he wanted to scrap it. I was like, no, no. I was like, that is sick, dude. I was like, that riff is cool. So we kind of worked it into a rough version of 10 Miles Wide. And then Josh, we showed it to Josh and he went downstairs into the basement. He's like, just give me a paper and a pen he's like i'll be back in 45 minutes and he went downstairs and wrote his parts and came up with the melody and then uh laid it down in the studio and you know showed it to us and everything and we we worked it and and made it into 10 miles wide and then and that ended up becoming a a single and a video song and so we got to see josh again and that was great it was cool yeah, yeah. And what was like the touring cycle like for this war is ours? Because I, I consider it kind of like the a warp t- tour kind of like classic. Because I know you did like warp tour during that time in like 09. Yeah. So touring for 
uh, as far as ours was here was was pretty hectic, man. We our touring schedule was was nuts. Uh, we were on the road so much, man. But it was great because that was exactly where we needed to be. You know, we needed to be on the road. We needed to be in, in front of people's faces and and uh, promote our 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 music and and ourselves. You know, and our band. And uh, so it was. It was crazy. I remember at the time. Sorry, I got a I got this tattoo that said "No home but the road" because we were just on the road so much. But it was cool. I liked it. Yeah, and like I said, the the album is now fifteen years old. I was like fourteen, and like a, during my freshman year of high school when that came out. So, do you have like a different perspective about it now as opposed to when you first put it out fifteen years ago? Uh, do I have a different perspective on it? Yeah, just like how do you feel about it that the album now as to when you first put it out? You know, I I probably look at albums differently than other people. Um I I look at like all the songs and stuff as like like I like I put I put a piece of me on this record. And so it's like, you know, I can say like, oh man, I remember writing these lyrics. I remember at the time I was going through this, or I remember at the time I was going through that, and, you know? Um, and so I don't know. They, they also just bring, bring back lots of good memories of, you know, friendship and like, you know, struggling through a lot of shit with the band and tour and, you know, doing warp tour in a van with, with no, you know, working AC and, you know, no, you know, dollies or equipment to bring our stuff to stage and trying to just to figure out life on the road. And, um, you know, it was, it, it's like that album during that time, like, that's what, like, that was like, make it or break it. That yeah. was one of those times where I was like, we went from like, we went from, we went from like baby band to real band. Yeah. You know, and then next up is the self-titled album. And I I like this album. What, what was that like going from This War is Ours to this? Uh, so I feel like, I feel like, I kind of feel like that album was the mistake album, man, to be honest with you. Like we had gotten an offer from Interscope Records because at the time our contract with Epitaph was, was running up and we had an option to do one more album and stay with them or go to another label. And we were advised to take this deal from Interscope because they were offering us a lot of money. And it was like, everyone dreams of, everyone always dreams of being on a major label, but um that at that time that's when like everyone got greedy and then once we found out like how much money like you could make as a writer and royalties and percentages and points and all this and that because we had already done two albums you know monty got greedy as hell he didn't want to share anything he didn't want to he didn't want to write with the guy he didn't want to write with anyone anymore and he wanted his brother in the band so he only wrote with his brother and he kind of held a thoughts hostage. It was like, I'm not touring unless my brother comes or, or I'm not going to record. I'm not going to write any music unless my brother, unless it's with my brother and that's it. I'm not writing with you guys. And it was really fucked up. Yeah. And that album, I remember when the label came to me and Ronnie and said, well, Hey, you guys started this band. You guys can divvy up the royalties and stuff because you, you you and Max wrote most of the songs on the on the album and the EP, so you guys can take most of the credit if you want to, and get most of the money. And we said no, we want everything to be split equally, no matter what. And then when it came around to do the Interscope deal, I didn't get the same love back from my from my from my boys. You know, instead of getting an equal. 
I got 5%. Shit. That's brutal. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, how but, they did it. Yeah. But what was the reason for the album being self-titled? Because usually a self-titled is usually the band's first, but it's like in the middle of the career. I feel like it's like a change or like a new start for a band. Like, was that sort of like the reason for it being self-titled? Well, yeah. Mon at the time, Monty or Brian, whatever, he he was like, he was having like a, I feel like he was having a, um, yeah, like a, like an identity crisis type thing like the band was because we were we played all these big warp tour shows and stuff and then we started with with josh todd and like you know the song 10 miles wide we started getting love from like a lot of like rock festivals and like rock people and stuff so it was kind of like okay well they wanted they wanted us to see if we could break into mainstream and be like be like kind of like a, like an edgy emo rock band now instead of like a warp tour like post hardcore metalcore whatever pop punk emo thing um and so yeah the idea was to to call it self titled because it was like the music on there is completely different from the other escape the fate albums um i think i like i like some of the songs on there but um i don't i don't love them like i do the other ones yeah like issues i think is a good song gorgeous yeah, nightmare same. massacre or like i think th those are some pretty good songs well, let me tell you something massacre is nothing but a bring me the horizon rip off really i wonder if yep, they i wonder wonder if they if they even heard of that song and what did they I wonder what they would have thought yeah listen to um um, that song, uh, it's on there. It's on Suicide Season. It's um, it's a secret. It's on the tip of my tongue. It's not the back of oh, my Oh, uh, Chelsea Smile. Yeah, listen to Chelsea Smile and then listen to Massacre. Yeah, I've always think thinking because like some songs sound similar because I know Escape the Fate had that song Broken Heart, Broken Heart from their uh, their album I Am Human, which sounds so much like uh, Help by Papa Roach, which came out two years prior. But it's just they just said it was just a coincidence. Yeah. Yeah, I think I was telling Robert that, uh, that 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 and he thought it was like, huh, no, it's just a coincidence, which it can be. Yeah, sometimes it shit happens, yeah. Yeah. But I just remember I remember Monty talked so much shit. He didn't like Bring Me the Horizon at first. He talked so much shit. And then I remember when he wrote Massacre, I looked at him and I was like, Really, dude? I was like, You just ripped off Bring Me the Horizon. I was like, This is bad. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know. No one else. No one really said anything, though. Like no one ever said that. But I was like, wow. I was like, I I heard it immediately, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, but then of course you tore it on the cell tile a little bit. And how hard was it to leave Escape the Fate the first time? Oh, uh, dude, it hurt so bad. Um, but I, I there's a video of me collapsing on stage. Yeah, I, I saw I that. Died. Yeah, I I officially died. I overdosed, and um died on stage and no one stopped playing no one cared like that's where we were at as a band at the time and so it was like shitty to leave and to like not know what's going on and to just everyone kind of be at odds with each other um and it sucked and then i remember i came back and i don't think that I, I don't know if at the time I feel like if if we were I don't even know if the the other guys were even equipped and ready for me to come back really because I don't think they fully understood what I was going up against like battling addiction and stuff because I remember you know there would be times where you know I would walk on the bus and they'd be people would be like breaking up pills or, or, you know, have lines of Coke and just alcohol everywhere. And I'm just like, Hey, you know, like dudes. And, uh, so it was tough. You know, I, it was, it was hard. And then eventually like I ended up just leaving, leaving for good. Yeah. Um, so, but it's cool though, because now, you know, Craig and I hang out, talk all the time. 
you know, sit and laugh about old stories and shit. Robert and I will talk and like, we'll, we'll run into each other places. And, um, it was great. We did the last tour with them or the, the tour we did with them before. Um, it was awesome. You know, I mean, they all talked about how good it was to be on stage again with each other and stuff. And it was, it was really, really, it was really cool. A lot of, like a lot of like learning and healing went on. Uh, and it was really nice. Right. And then of course, after you left escape the fate, you started up the natural born killers. Tell me about like that, because I don't think nobody ever talks about that band. Yeah. So dude, that was, <clears throat> that was like, that was going to be like my fuck you to escape the fate type thing. Um, Cause I felt like they did me dirty. And so I had linked up with this guy uh, named Clayton and he was a really talented writer and producer and we wrote like so many songs. We had like 70 songs for Natural Born Killers. So many. And uh fucking I actually have like our album on my um on my on my uh, phone on my iTunes. And like it's not released, no one's heard it. Um and it's cool, man. Like I, I really liked it a lot. I felt like that was like a game changer. Like that shit that we were doing about to release was so far we were like so far ahead of like of 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 the time man like it was it would have been really it would have been like a shockwave to people uh it either would have been a shockwave or people just wouldn't have got it um but that essentially you know was the dude i was in a band with um i think that maybe at the time he got kind of wrapped up in like uh feeling like oh i'm gonna be in a band with max to escape the fate like you know that dude's got a wild history and reputation like I, I need to be wild too if i'm gonna be in a band with him if we're gonna do this like we need to we need to one up escape the fate i was like no man like we don't need to do that we don't need to do all that <laughs> yeah just do like your own thing yeah but uh so we had a we had a lawyer and you know talk we were talking to a label and getting ready to sign sign a deal and everything and um it just kind of erupted and things got weird and so it ended up just kind of not happening um yeah yeah, yeah but, but it would have been really cool I, I still listen to those songs actually to this day and i'm like yeah from the oblivion still. ep yeah those and uh even dude there's a lot more man there's a lot yeah do you think those songs will ever see the light of day um i don't know maybe i mean i can send you some if you want yeah i'd be down to check that out i mean you got my number we can try to work something cool yeah yeah but then of course 2013 you rejoined escape the fate how did that end up happening so i had moved to kentucky and um i decided to move back home with my parents and um like really, really give sobriety like a real like like hey like I need to do this shit to save my life, um, yeah. and so I was out there, and I remember um, I hadn't really been going to meetings or anything yet at the time, and uh, I remember I had been I had been living there in Ohio I think it was for like yeah. for like maybe a little over a month or two. And Escape the Fate was coming through on tour. And so I texted them and said, hey, I don't know if you guys want to see me or not, but you know, I've been living in Ohio. I've been clean for like 60 days. Um, it would really be nice to see you guys and just say hi. Like, if, if you don't want to, I totally understand. But um, I'd love to just come say hi and just check out the show. Um, so I went and saw them and they were like, wow, dude, you look amazing. Like, you look healthy. You, you know, you sound good, look good, blah, blah, blah. And... Uh, it was cool. And then after, after the show that night, um, they were hanging out by the bus, signing autographs. And this lady came up to me with her daughter. I was like, Hey, can we get a picture? I was like, yeah, sure. And she goes, Hey, she goes, what are you doing here? By the way, she was like, I thought you lived in Vegas. And for some reason I dude, I don't know. I, cause I've never said this to anyone else. I was completely honest with her and I just blurted out. I said, I'm a junkie and I moved here to save my life to get sober and that lady started crying and she was like 
there's a reason that we, why we met. She says, I'm in recovery. She says, and I, I have 12 years clean and sober. She's like, take my number. She says, tell me where you, wherever you live. She's like, I will come pick you up every day, take you to a meeting with me and take you home and buy you food every day. She's like, but you have to come to meetings. And you have to stay clean. So I was like, okay. And so. And how clean I have did. you stayed for, stayed for? Um, so then I was, so from then, like I would, I would get like a year three. I remember, at the, I remember at the time, the most, the highest I had for a while was like three years. I would get like three years clean and then something would happen and I would relapse. And, but like, I wasn't really like, at the time, like I wasn't like, like working on identifying like my triggers and like really, I was only like working the program to a certain, to a certain extent type thing. You know what I mean? Um, and I also was obsessing over clean time and like, it just became this thing where I was like, I was adding all this stress and shit onto me, um, that like I didn't need. Um, but at this time, I would say, Probably, I would say five or six years at this point now. Yeah, congrats, by the way. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, yeah, it's been a, uh, it's been, uh, it's been crazy. I don't know, man. Man, life is fucking wild. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but what was that like? Like playing, playing with Escape the Fate again, and of course, like of course, oh. meeting, of course, um, uh, TJ who who left Motionless and White to replace you, and of course, uh, Thrasher. What was like your first impressions of them? So I knew Kevin from back in the day. We actually toured with Kevin a lot when he was in this band called Buff Hate Hero. So Escape the Fate toured with him a lot back then. And he had been actually wanting to wanting to join Escape the Fate even back then. So it was cool. We were already friends. We already had like a friendship and a history. So that was easy. That was easy street. Me and Kevin hit it off great. Um, TJ, on the other hand, at first, TJ and I were not friends. <laughs> um, yeah, because he replaced but- you. He, because he replaced me, and I, I think that he had this, um, he kind of had this thing where it was like, uh, he wanted to let me know, like, it was like a male dominance thing. Like, he wanted to let me know that, you know, he replaced me, and I'm the new guy. So, like, I'm the low man on the totem pole type thing. And he, I don't know, had like a chip on his shoulder or something, like, you know, and so I was like, I came into that like just thinking, just being grateful to be back in my own old band. That's all. Like I wasn't trying to take shit over. I wasn't trying to do anything. I was just, I was just glad to be there. Um, and I remember TJ and I got into an argument once and we were on the bus. He got mad at me for something. We had, we were buddy heads or whatever. And uh, I think it was like over um, like, not helping unload the bus on the last tour or something. And I was like, well, you know, I didn't have a car. I wasn't even living in LA and he was just like on my ass for everything. And I remember I, 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 I had like slip ons at the time or something. And so I took my shoes off, I slipped them off and I kicked him towards him. And I said, why don't you put those on? You've been trying to fill them for a while. And I walked away and everyone was like, Oh shit. (laughs) But after some like butting heads a little bit like you know we talked and it was like i was like dude i'm not trying to i'm not trying to come in here and like get you out so i can have my old spot back yeah like that's not what this is i'm like you know i i know that 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 you know you're a part of this band now like and i know like you live and breathe it and and like i know because him and craig hit it off him and craig were like best buddies man and they still are their friendship is very unique man like you can tell when they get together like they just they they just have a blast with each other and i wasn't trying to infringe on anything and but i understand tj being a little nervous me me coming back around you know yeah so yeah, and then of course you toured for a little bit, and then of course you left to escape, escape the fate the second time. What time? How hard was it to leave again? So it was crazy because 
we had we had toured with Five Finger Death Punch and it was great. And then at the time, Craig was drinking a lot, a ton. And then I started drinking again. And I wasn't doing anything else. I was just drinking. And um, it was like Craig was making bad decisions. And at the time, they were constantly reminding me that it's not my band anymore. And I felt very disrespected because, uh, I mean, I had come up with a fucking name. I was like, in the back of my mind, I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, I built this for you guys. Like, you know, my I was a big part of this fucking thing. Like, I'm not trying to come back in and run shit, but I was like trying to tell them like, you know, before I was a mess and I had to leave. I'm like, now I come back and you guys are a mess. I was like, yeah. you need to get your shit together. Yeah, so you know? it's sort of like the roles reversed. Yes. And so um, they weren't paying me, um, which was fine. I didn't want to get paid. I just wanted to be, I just wanted to play again. I just wanted to be with my boys. I just wanted to play and be in a band and be in my old band. And so I remember I got a call from Ronnie one day saying that he was having issues with his bass player. And did I want to join? Did I want to come and join his band? And, you know, it could be like old times again. And he asked me, you know, if I was, how it wasn't escape the fate. And I said, dude, they're, I'm like, dude, I'm not even in the band, dude. I'm like, they, they, I'm officially not even in the band. I'm like, I'm not even like a hired guy. I'm like, I could, they could go on tour tomorrow and not tell me and bring someone else. I'm like, now at this point, I'm like, I feel like they're just having me around for nostalgia sake to try to like revive their fucking careers or whatever, try to like re spark, you know, their, their touring and shit because they weren't doing well. And so Ronnie was like, well, Hey, you know, I can, my, my business and my band is doing really well. He's like, you know, I can give you a, a steady paycheck. He was like, I know I can give you a steady paycheck and, and, and pay you and, and, you know, you can, you'll be able to survive. And so I was like, well, I talked to Escape the Fate. I didn't tell him what was going on. I, I just asked him, like, well, hey, like, what's going on with the money? Like, when are we touring again? No one had any answers for me. So I told Ronnie, I was like, well, yeah, I'll, I'll come do it. And so I went and learned, went and stayed with Ronnie for a little bit, learned uh, some Falling in Reverse songs. And then Escape the Fate had a tour, and I found out last minute. And um, their manager called me up and was asking me where I was. And I felt terrible because it wasn't supposed to happen like this. And I remember I, at the time, I didn't know what to say. And so I just said the first thing that came to my mind. I said, hey, my mom said um, something happened to my mom. Like she's sick or something like that. And, and I have to stay. I have to go home for a couple of days to figure some things out. I said, but I'll meet you guys um, on the tour in a couple of days. And I, I hung up the phone. I, I didn't know what to say. I was like panicking. And um, then I did this interview for AP magazine because it was a yeah. big deal that the story was, you know, Max and Ronnie, the two. Yeah, two I remember that. The fate, you know, back in, you know, back together. And now in, Max is in falling in reverse, like, you know, People said it would never happen, and now it's happening. And um, so they ended up running their story um, ahead of time. And I remember um, Ronnie came into my room, and he was like, hey, man, he said, I just want to say that I'm, I'm really sorry and that I'm really pissed off because it wasn't supposed to happen like this. I said, I swear. He said they weren't supposed to run this story for another week or two. But um, someone at AP Magazine pushed it through, and they they put it out. And so your story is out there about you quitting Escape the Fate, enjoying Falling Reverse. And so then I called the guys in Escape the Fate, and I was like, oh, shit, like, oh, shit. And um, they had just gotten off stage, and I remember Kevin had sent a text saying, you know, hey, like, good luck or whatever or some shit. Like, and um, same with Craig. And I was like, they were pissed off. They were like, you know, like, you could have fucking told us, man. Like, you lied to us, blah, blah, blah. And 
I just felt like the world's biggest asshole. Yeah. And I was like, man, like I, but I didn't want it to happen like that. I, I wanted to tell them like, Hey, like I wanted to have an adult conversation, like basically saying, Hey, I'm glad you guys brought me back. It's been great touring with you guys, but I also have to live and I can't live off of $15 a day per diem. And then no money when I'm not on the tour with you guys. And I can't continue on, continue on, like not knowing if I'm in the band, not in the band. Like, I, I don't know. Like, am I, am I going to write with you guys? Like, like you guys won't tell me anything. And I, I wanted to have that conversation with them, but I never got to. And I feel terrible still to this day about it. Yeah. Yeah. But of course now, now you're good with them again. Yeah, but now everything's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But tell me about like joining up, falling in reverse, verse with Ronnie. Ronnie, how was that like playing with him for a little period? It was interesting because there was times where I felt uh, embraced, and I felt like it was like old times. And then there was times where I felt like Ronnie almost kind of had me around to just kind of put kind of rub my face in it a little bit like like look how successful i am type yeah. thing you know it's kind of shitty yeah and then, uh, yeah i know no and no you also did that uh green day cover of she's a rebel which is apparently for a kareng tribute album tell me about like like that cover because it, it is pretty good good song tell me about like make how'd you hook up with kareng to do it do a do a tribute album wait who was that with if that was for Kerrang. It was like what a tri- band now? It was like Green Day. You did like the sh- a cover of She's a Rebel. No, what band was it? Falling in Reverse or was it Escape the Fate? Falling in Reverse. Yeah. So, um, I didn't actually do that. I don't know if they had someone else do it. So here's the thing: when when Falling in Reverse releases stuff or whatever, um, it's just um from my I don't know about any more, but back in the day. Um, they had um, studio studio musicians um, come in and, and play majority of the stuff. Huh. Yeah, so um, Jackie would come in and play some solos or whatever. Ryan would play drums, of course, but guitars and bass and stuff was, was mostly tracked by studio musicians. Yeah, I never knew that. That's so a yeah. fucking fucking Wikipedia lied. <laughs> Oh, we could be, do never trust Wikipedia, bro. Yeah, ever. yeah, same. <laughs> I I know if the, if you're familiar with Loudwire, they do like Wikipedia fact or fiction and with with uh, like artists and try to like see what's real and what's bullshit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, yeah, we, yeah, it's so fucking weird. Yeah, yeah. But then, of course, you started up a uh, violent new breed, and hard to believe it's also been ten years since the band first started. Because I know the band formed in 2013. So how do you feel about the band now, 10 years later? So that's crazy because like I, at the time I was like, I need to, I'm like, I want to start a band, you know? And I came up with the name. I, I got the name violent new breed from this band that I was a big fan of um, called shotgun Messiah. And it was Tim scolds band from the eighties. Um, and I remember I was at a party once and Tim Scold was there in Hollywood and, and I, I approached him and I asked him, say, Hey, I, you know, my name's Max. I'm friends with so-and-so who's here at the party with you. And I was like, you know, I'd really love to start a band and call it Violent New Breed. I was like, but I know that that's the title of one of your last albums in the, in your old eighties band. I was like, I was wondering if I could just have your blessing to use it. And he said, yeah, he's like, that's great. He's like, are you kidding me? He's like, I always thought that would be a great band name too. It's like, cool. And so I, before I even had a band or anything, I just started, you know, my thought process at the time was, you know, tell everyone about my band before I even have a real band. And that, and then when I get members and get music, people will already kind of be familiar with the name. Um, that is a bad idea. Don't do that because mm-hmm. What it turned into was, you know, I was still, you know, obviously working through addictions and stuff and, you know, had a lot of things going on internally and on the outside. And so I was writing music and, you know, but failing at life. And so it was like Violent New Breed was a thing, but it was just me. And 
you know, then when I finally found members and stuff, I did a, an EP released it, um, went on tour of drowning pool. Um, and then, um, yeah, that EP is good with you singing and of course playing guitar. How was that like being the lead singer for that? Dude, honestly, that was a lot of, it was a lot of fun. And I, and you I have a great it. voice. Thanks, man. You know what? That came about by accident. We were supposed to have someone else come and be the singer and he ended up not being able to make it. And he was like, nah, man, I'm not going to do it. So we were in the studio. We were like, well, our and then you were like, like, fuck it. I'll sing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. There we go. It's still like a great EP, like Broken Soul, uh, Rumors. Like it's only six songs, but it's just a banger after banger. Yeah, I really like to like re-record that thing. I, I I really would love to just continue that and just kind of put out music like that again and 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 sing it and just kind of have it be my solo thing or whatever. Uh, because yeah. I really like that music and a lot of people. A lot of people loved it too. They were like, you know, they, they, a lot of people said it's cool because it it's reminiscent of like old original Escape the Fate, but it's different. And yeah. like, it's cool because yeah, I wrote all the guitars, the bass. Yeah. I mean, I demoed all those songs out. Yeah. So, and of course, like, how is that like playing guitar? guitar because i know like at the beginning like you said guitar was your first instrument before switching to bass like how different of a feel of it is it playing guitar versus playing bass um bass is a lot of fun for sure um i love bass i my i think like a bass player um guitar is also equally fun it really is but guitar is like um it requires more focus and attention you know what i mean to like play everything and play it properly and play it in time and you know make sure you're striking every chord and every note the right way and um so there's a lot more that goes into that versus bass i mean there's those there's those times you know as a bass player as well where you really have to focus on you know oh i know that this note right here on the bass you know yes it's the right note but it doesn't it doesn't resonate just the frequency of it doesn't hit as hard so if I play that same note here instead, it's I know it's going to sound better. Like there's those things as well. Um, but um, I I had a lot of fun though doing it. I had a lot of fun because I love writing songs. So I had a lot of fun writing those and demoing them out and then recording them in the studio. Um, it was really really cool just to even just be like, hey, you know, I can I can do this. Yeah. And then of course the your recent release, Bad Reputation, I think was a great great follow-up to the, the self-titled EP. Tell me about like the making of that, that album. So that came about, um, I was living in Kentucky. I moved back out to Vegas. I met this guy named Sean McGee and, uh, I just, he's a producer. He, he used to work with, uh, Kevin and Kane Churko who do all like the five finger death punch albums and stuff he was an engineer for them. And so he had his own studio and, uh, you know, we just worked out a deal to record a couple songs and he, he really liked them a lot. He loved them. And me and him just like hit it off with music and, and playing and stuff. And, um, he heard me saying that I needed another guitar player. And he was like, well, Hey man, he's like, I would love to, to be in your band. I would love to be your other guitar player. And, um, cause him and I wrote really well together. And so I said, okay, great. And, um, so it originally was just supposed to be, an, I was only going there to record like two or three songs and then it turned into six songs and then it turned into him joining the band and us doing a full length album. And uh, then once we got the music done, we, the music took a different direction once he joined um, and it required a vocalist with more experience than than I had at the time for sure it required someone with a much better voice and much more range and and abilities to do things um and so we kind of pivoted and I had my um other guitar player Sean I had him sing on on the on the album and I I sang on one song called a goodbye um I actually sing on that one yeah, but the other ones I just do screams and backup vocals on. But um, yeah, I like I liked those songs a lot. I do wish, truth be told, I do think that album 
is a little too mid tempo. I don't think that it it didn't it didn't come across entirely like I wanted it to. It kind of came across a little more like radio rock sounding than I wanted it to. I didn't want that. It wasn't my intention originally. But I do still think that the songs are very good, and I do like them. I, I like them a lot still. Yeah. Um, and we ended up getting signed to a label. Yeah, which and, was CBG Records. How did they find uh, you? SBG. SBG. For some reason, I guess I'd see. <laughs> so um, the guy who owns the label and runs it, his name's uh, Shan. And he used to work at Century Media when I was there negotiating an, an, a record deal for Natural Born Killers. And so when I was doing Violent New Breed and recording this album, um, I had just kind of put the word out that I was doing stuff and he had hit me up and, or I think maybe I wrote him and said, Hey, I'd love to show you some music and catch up. And he said, yeah. And so I, I showed him the songs and he said, well, Hey, I've got a label that I'm starting. I'd love to, I'd love to find you and kind of resurrect the Max Green story. So we signed a deal for an album and we did it and we were about to go on tour and we had everything set up and um, people started talking about like, you know, COVID was like coming out and yeah. it was on the news and I, I was following it really closely and I, I had a bad feeling about it. And I remember we were supposed to go, we were supposed to leave. And at the last minute I pulled out and I said, no, I was like, no, 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 no. I was, it was like, like spider senses tingling. Yeah. I was like, we can't go. I was like, I'm telling you guys, we can't go. And I had managers calling me saying, well, I'm going to let you explain to the other bands why they're missing out on all this money and blah, blah, blah. And then about two or three days later, it came out that towns were shutting down and people were getting stuck and you couldn't get in or out of states. And I was like, told you guys. Yeah. Told you. Um, but when that happened, our our label, I called him up and I said, well, hey, well, what are we going to do? And he was like, man, I don't know. Like it, He just had a very independent label. He only had a, a couple acts that he really put money into and um, he didn't know what to do with us. So he was like, I'm, I'm sorry, like, hopefully this blows over soon. But if not, like, you know, hit me back up when all this clears up, because I'd love to keep working with you. But I don't know what I can do for you right now. Yeah. So that album kind of got shelved. Yeah. And then I think I, it's I, a pretty good album still. I like it. So yeah, I, I love I look at that, too. Yeah, I love like the opening track, Bury Me, which of course has Howard Jones, formerly of Killswitch Engage, now with Like the Torch. How'd you end up hooking, working with uh, Howard? Because I think he's one of the best vocalists going still today. Oh, yeah. So Shan, actually, the from the label, he had done a lot of uh, videos and things for Howard. He's really close friends with them. So he sent him some of our songs and said, hey, you know, I've got this band I've just signed. Um, I want to send you a couple tracks, see what you think. And he really liked Bury Me a lot. And so we asked him if he wanted to do vocals on it. And he was like, yeah, I'd love to. Um, so he, we, we sent him the lyrics and, you know, said, you know, just do what you want to do. And we will kind of edit it together and then we'll send it back. And once we have your approval, we'll, we'll put on the album. And he was very cool about everything. He, he yeah. killed it. Yeah. And and tell me about like the newer newer songs that you put out, Sanctuary and Ruination. Is that like something for the next Violent New Breed album or are they just kind of like one off kind of things? Um, so those are songs that we we ended up um when we when I when I revamped the band after the whole corona thing and everyone kind of went separate ways, you know, now I'm at a point where I'm like, man. You know, I just can't get Violent New Breed off the ground. No matter what I do, it's been years now. And every time I try, something happens and it fails. So I said, I'm going to give it one more go. And I'm going to try to come at this at a different angle. So I met some people, started a band. Um, we found a singer. Then through that, through the singer auditions, I met this producer named Hiram. And or I met him online. Um, and... I hit him up and said, Hey, you know, you know, I'd love to, can we, can we work out a deal or something? So he recorded a couple songs for us. Yeah, I think he fucking hit it out of the park. Um, and uh, we started just releasing them just to try to get the word out, you know, try to just start the band up again. And um, it was cool. We got on tour to escape the fate and everything. And, yeah. but um, it's, 
it's been shitty because it's like, I don't know. I think I may, I think I'm, I, I don't know. I think that it's tough being in a band with people who have not toured or really been in bands before. Yeah. Got to find like the committed people that are for in it for the cause. Yeah. And so that's where I'm at right now. I'm just having issues with, you know, being able to find people that are understand, you know, that just understand like, Hey, like I've got a, I, I, I'm going to be in a band. Like every, everyone has a position. Everyone has a part to play. Everyone has their role and you just got to stick to it for it to, for the machine to work and go, you know? Yeah. And what is the so, status with the, the next violent Bre- Bre- new breed album? Um, do you have like a release date or anything or what, what can you t- say that if you're allowed to, um, you know, as of right now, I think that as of right now, I think Violent New Breed will probably just end up turning into like my solo stuff because yeah. there's just like, I like, yeah, just cause it's, I just have a feeling that that's what it's going to end up being. Like there's, there's still, there's a couple songs that still, that I'll, that I'll put out um, that, you know, have the other guys on them and stuff that, that, that were recorded and worked on. But, um, for future stuff, like I might, I honestly, I don't even, I don't even know if I'll use the name violent new breed anymore, just because like you said, like it's been 10 years now and it sucks because we've talked to a couple record labels and that's what they said. They were like, well, Hey, like you've been a band for 10 years, like what's going on. And I had to explain to them, well, like, it hasn't actually been a band for this long. It's just a name that I liked and I started talking about and I just did these tours to try to keep my name out there and yada, yada. But, um, so I almost feel like the name violent new breed at this point is like a curse because it's just been around too long. Yeah. And, and one, and it's kind of switching topics. I want to talk about like, your bass playing because as I know we joke and t- said earlier in the interview, like, like I've heard, you know, you've heard all the bass player jokes and the memes and stuff, but I always feel like you don't gravitate towards flashy bass playing, but instead I feel like you find ways to link what the guitars are doing with the melody and what the drums are doing with the rhythm. So what is your approach to tracking the bass? Yeah. Like, so if you listen to the bass on, um, on the EP, you know, on Dying Choice Fashion, and then on This War Is Ours, that is, that is my actual bass playing, and that's my actual thought process. Those are my ideas that I came up with and, and recorded and tracked. If you listen to the bass on the self-titled album, um, that is not me. So, um, and if you, if you, if you listen to the two and, and, and l- listen to the bass on the other albums and then on the self-titled escape the fate album you would say wow like you know max went from you know moving around and learning and like you know doing little fills and things like that and little octave runs here and there like to just kind of playing along with the guitar it, but i didn't that wasn't me um <laughs> but my i feel like my thought process has always been like, I don't know, two people I've always really liked as bass players, to be completely honest with you, is, well, there's three. There is, this is going to sound really funny, but the bass player from Leonard Skinner, like, I love classic rock. And if you listen to any Leonard Skinner songs, like that bass player fucking rips, dude. That guy is all over the place. He knows when to get down. He knows when to just chill back. But he always he he knows how to he knows how to make the song. He knows he knows when to let it breathe and he knows when to build tension. He knows like how to how to how to take your emotions places. Um and then I've always liked um the bass player from Maiden. Steve Harris. yeah, Steve Harris. My favorite and, bass player of all time. Dude, him. And then um, I was a big uh, fan of uh, Anti-Flag 
when I was growing up. Yeah. Um, their bass player is fucking amazing. Yeah. That guy is just nuts. Um, yeah. Have you ever covered any Maiden songs on bass? No, but I would. I would. I would yeah. love to. My one of my favorite Maiden songs is "Fear of the Dark." I yeah, love I would love that. that. Yeah, yeah. I remember when I saw them live a few years ago. Uh, saw them live last year in um in a, in North Carolina. I road tripped up there. They played that. All the whole crowd was singing. Awesome. Yeah, they're definitely one of the 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 best live band I've seen yet. And they pretty much put like bands that are like half the rage or even more to shame live. Dude, I played with them in Germany, and it was insane dude it was crazy yeah um, yeah yeah one thing i also love to know about is like what kind of what's what's like your uh your rig set up like because i know you played with like uh ernie ernie St- stingray ba- basses i'm always curious about what kind of like like the strings pedals and amps you use um so i'm i'm a really big fan of the ampeg 610 cabs <clears throat> i like those a lot i don't like the 810s very much i i think they just they don't, um, I don't know, they don't, they're not punchy enough. I don't know. The 610s are perfect because, like, they're they're loud, they're boomy, they growl, but they also, like, have this punch where it's, like, it, it cuts through when it needs to. Um, currently, I have, um, I used to do an Ampeg 610, one on each side of the stage, or an 810 on either side of the stage if I didn't have my 610s. And um, I used to use the SVT Classic Heads, the old tube ones, but I really, really like the Fender Bassman heads. Those Fender for bass gear is the shit, dude. That is the best. Um, and but currently, right now, I use mainly. Um, I go back and forth between my Ibanez five string and my and my Music Man basses. Um, and uh, I have a Dark Glass um, six ten cab, and then. Um, I mess around with a couple of dark glass pedals. Like I think it's like the B7K, and then um, I have a, a Kemper for my head, um, and the Kemper's great because, dude, I could just make anything I want on there, and make it come to life. Um, so, but I use some fat, fat strings. Let me see if I got something here. Actually, um, looks like Ernie big- Ball. Well, I have to use custom strings um, because they don't make they don't make sets for me that I play in. So, I play my low string is a one forty five. Yeah, is Deep Dario. Yeah, and then um, <clears throat> and then I just from there I just use like um, the rest. I just use like Ernie Ball, um, like a like the heaviest five string set you can find. I'll just use those strings, but I'll just put on the one forty five because I think. They only go to like 140 and Ernie Ball or something, or 135. Yeah. So, yeah. but yeah. Yeah. So, God, uh, I pretty much keep it pretty simple. Oh, yeah. dude, my phone is about to die. Yeah. So, so we're kind of, so we're pretty much about at the end anyway. So, kind of in the end to sort of, sort of wrap things up, what's next for you? Do you have any like, uh, new, like I think you mentioned you're slowly starting work on new music. Have you, yeah, is there any like, uh, tours or anything you'd like to, to plug if you're allowed to, to say? Um, no tours at the moment, um, that are on the books or anything like that, which is crappy because we've had a lot of tour offers, but, um, it just didn't happen, which breaks my, breaks my heart but um um i have been writing a lot of music um i've been writing a lot of acoustic music i've been writing a lot of like heavy music i've actually been like diving in a seven string a lot recently um really like writing a lot of heavy stuff and i've been like really getting into like synth and trying to i want to try and make a like cinematic big sounding band with just a few members that's something like like a metal or heavier version of like 21 pilots or imagine dragons like just something that's huge cinematic sounding but like metal ish at the same time like if that makes sense like i don't know yeah yeah so So, uh, yeah you were saying Oh, I say, but I am working on music, and I will be releasing stuff. So yeah, it'll be cool. So uh, before we go, I just want to thank you, Max, for taking your time to do this conversation. It was great to be able to talk with you about your history. There's just any final words you want to say to the viewers that are watching this to close this out. 
Um, you know, thanks for having me on here, man. It's It's been a blast. I always appreciate anytime anybody wants to talk to me about anything. It's cool. Like uh, my whole experience in music is just felt like just I just want to give back. You know, I've been on both sides of the fence. I say a lot. Been a fan for a long time. I still am. And now I'm in a position where, you know, people are fans of some of my art, which I'm forever grateful for. So um, I guess I just want to say thanks to anyone who's ever listened or connected with, you know, any music or any words. Um, there will be more. So yeah. thank you guys so much. And I look forward to releasing more music. Awesome. So everybody, Max Green from Violent New Breed. We'll see you next time.